Hashem Hashem Naaseh V'Natzliach, Shir Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are back here uh, starting a new week to continue our series of the uh, Jewish Ashkafa based on the extraordinary Sefer by the Chazonish, Emunah uh, V'Bitachon, Faith and Trust. Uh, tonight's shiur will be for a Refua Shlema for Rav Shlomo Ben Golda, Rabbanit uh, Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbanit uh, Levana Bat Sarah, הרב אפרים בן שולמית, אבי מורי דוד בן אסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ואה, and הצלחה רבה to all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahites that continue to learn Torah with us, continue to contribute, continue to share our Torah across the world, ברוך השם, as the uh, reach of the Torah is endless, ברוך השם. Uh, just to uh, remind some of you that perhaps uh, haven't uh, contributed yet or haven't uh, jumped on the offer yet that we have, uh, as I mentioned to you, we have eight new USBs uh, in our uh, store. For anyone that wants to buy the uh, eight uh, USB set, you can go to bezatashem.org. Uh, also, as a side reminder, the best place to watch our Shulim live is either on our app, the Bezat Hashem app, or bh.live. But anyone that wants the USBs, you want to listen to it uh, anywhere you want, you have the USBs on the store. But also for those of you that want to share the USBs in your communities and uh, get a very big discount, uh, and in essence, our partnership with you on uh, Kiruv, uh, go to tikunabrit.live, where over there you can sponsor uh, 100 USBs or more uh, for a fraction of the cost, only about $10 a, a USB that uh, you can get uh, delivered to your home, wherever that may be. Uh, the uh, details are over there. Uh, tikunabrit.live. T as in tikkun, I-K-K-U-N-H-A-B-R-I-T uh, dot L-I-V-E. Uh, you go over there, you can get yourself a $1,000 uh, worth of USBs or more and uh, get uh, the USBs Bezat Hashem within a matter of a couple of weeks uh, delivered to your home. Uh, also, you'll be able to, uh, by contributing to this uh, at this time, you'll be able to enter the raffle uh, to win a potentially a, a, a round-trip ticket to Eretz Yisrael, where we're going to be having the event. Uh, the uh, details of the event uh, are out now. We're going to you know, put out a flyer uh, poster uh, very soon, but uh, we got some details. We finalized. I signed the contract uh, today, Baruch Hashem. Uh, it's going to be in the uh, great synagogue of Jerusalem. Baruch Hashem, it's an extraordinarily beautiful, huge synagogue. Baruch Hashem, honestly, when I saw it the first time, it looked like it was the third Bet HaMikdash, which is so beautiful. Uh, and uh, it's going to be on the 4th of August. The 4th of August, Zayin Be'av. The 7th of Av, the 4th of August. Uh, it's going to be right before Tisha Be'av. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we're expecting a uh, huge crowd, so anyone that wants to uh, attend is welcome to attend. You just have to RSVP by sending me a message, letting me know who's coming, the names, the uh, phone number, uh, email address, so at least we can count for you and Baruch uh, Hashem, uh, have you uh, join us. Uh, it's going to be a uh, multi-part event. Baruch Hashem, is going to be about four or five hours. A lot of extraordinary rabbis, huge rabbis. We have uh, the Rishon Letzion, Baruch Hashem is going to be there. The uh, um, Av Bedin of uh, Yerushalayim, uh, uh, Rav Gidon Ben Moshe, the Av Bedin of Israel, uh, Rav uh, Yaakov Zamir, uh, our own very dear Rav Ephraim, uh, Rav uh, uh, Shlomo Sharvit, and many other rabbinim are going to be there as long, along with myself. We're also looking to uh, get several other uh, guest, uh, guest to join us as well. We'll give you some more details when that happens. Uh, but it's going to be an extraordinary event. There's other going to be a video and a uh, poster and a lot of other details. But uh, for those of you that are avid watchers of our uh, lectures and also want to know the details of exactly when the event is, as I said, it's going to be on the 4th of August, uh, right a few days before Tisha B'Av, at the Great Synagogue of uh, Jerusalem. You could actually look at details on the uh, synagogue online it's truly a magnificent place uh, so uh, with that in mind again any of you that are looking to contribute that want to sponsor the usbs to give them out yourself or for us to give them out please go to tikunabrit.live uh, with that being said we have a lot of material uh, on uh, the jewish ashkafa that we have to go over uh, which Be'ezrat Hashem uh, will be able to go through uh, because of course we uh, just uh, here in the exile 
And in Diaspora, we uh, read Parashat Korach last week, the parasha that's full of machloket, the extraordinary machloket, the, the big fight between Korach and his followers versus Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Aaron, and in essence, Akadosh Baruch Hu himself. And uh, of course, we saw the end of those, uh, of those uh, people that went against Moshe, that went against Akadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, but the Midrash Rabbah says, Ubnei Korach lo metu, that the sons of Korach did not die. Now, the pshat of the pasuk, the simple meaning of the pasuk, is that the sons of Korach saved themselves by doing tshuva last minute. Last minute, as the debate, as the fight was going, they realized that they can't choose their own father's side, <clears throat> and they went to Moshe Rabenu's side, which, of course, they didn't know what the end was going to be. They didn't know that the ground was going to open up and eat up uh, and uh, Korach and anyone that followed him or his whole family, uh, the, all of his servants, the, uh, the rabbis that followed him, they all got burned, but uh, the, the servants and the rest of the family of Korach all went to Gehenom, and they're still there 3,333 years later. Uh, but the uh, few sons of Korach, they didn't die because HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw that they did tshuva despite the fact that their father threatened them that if uh, they go with Moshe Rabenu, they're going to be uh, uh, thrown out of the family, no inheritance, no money, and Korach was the richest man in the world. So they took all of that and threw it in the garbage in order to go with the Emet, in order to go with Moshe Rabenu. And uh, because of that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a special miracle for them that when the mouth of Gehenom opened up, everyone fell, including the sons of Korach, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a miracle happen where a, uh, something came out of the wall to, uh, right under the feet of the sons of Korach to stop them and literally shield them from the fire of Gehenom that is still burning Korach till this day. That's in essence the Pshat of the Pasuk. But the Midrash says that there is also a, uh, another meaning, another meaning behind the scenes of what Bnei Korach lo metu means, the sons of Korach didn't die, that the ideology uh, of Korach is still in the world today. That's his children that's still in the world today that is creating all types of machloket, all types of fights uh, in different synagogues and different yeshivot, different uh, uh, ways of uh, learning and teaching. And of course, a machloket is only when there is two sides and both of them are standing for the truth, not when one is standing for a lie. So it's important to know that there is a machloket and then there is simply calling out a heretic. When you are, uh, you know, you have the emet, you have your shita, you have your ashkafa, you have the way that you're doing things, and that's the way of the emet. And someone has uh, a different ashkafa, a different chasidut, a different uh, way of doing things. There's no problem to, uh, to have different ways. And sometimes those uh, differences create a uh, machloket. Uh, you know, when one posek says that the, uh, uh, the, the other posek is incorrect in his alacha, that's not necessarily a, uh, a bad thing. This is the way of our Torah. Anyone that has learned Gemara for more than five minutes knows that the Gemara is full of uh, debates back and forth of what's the truth and how to arrive at the truth and what tools to use and how to use those tools. But when it comes to heretics that are distorting the Torah, what's called Megalim Panim Bat Torah, that in essence they're showing a new face to the Torah where it's not the Torah itself, it's something else. They're bringing their own opinion to the Torah. They're bringing a, uh, their own truth to the Torah. That's a heretic. That's a person that is not a machloket when you call him out. That's in essence fulfilling the mitzvah of limchot et amalek, to destroy amalek. That's a person that's distorting the Torah. So that's not a machloket. But unfortunately, many times people that don't know the details, uh, don't know much Torah, they think that both are the same things. That when you say that somebody's a heretic, somebody's an idol worshiper, it's the same thing as having a machloket with someone that actually has yirat shamayim. And of course, we learn from the Torah that's uh, worlds apart between the two. But either way, the, uh, the world perceives things in a certain way, and we have to understand uh, how to uh, how to deal with certain people and how to work on ourselves in order to make sure that people do receive the Torah in a beautiful way and apply it to their lives. Hence the reason why sometimes there are certain things that uh, the Torah will say that uh, don't necessarily make, make uh, common sense, don't make uh, rational sense to people. And this is when you truly see who's seeking the truth and who's not. The one that's not looking for the truth it says that as long as something doesn't make sense to me, I'm not going to do it. 
and the one that is seeking the truth says listen even though it doesn't make sense to me and even though i've learned things a, a different way until now since this is the truth that's it i'm just gonna follow what it says now this is why we have parashat korach is connected to parashat chukat because parashat chukat this week's parasha starts with the mitzvah of the para aduma, the red heifer and this para aduma is a uh, is a is a mystery to all of mankind of how it works because in essence what you're doing is you're taking this para you're taking this heifer that's completely red that there was never any burden on it it never worked a day in its life and not even a minute in its life you after you slaughter it and you uh, burn the uh, everything to ashes you use it in order to purify the impure now up till now everybody understands how that works this is a, obviously a sgula this is something that akadosh Baruch Hu instilled into the world the part that confuses even Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest man of all time, is that the one that is purifying everybody else, meaning the Kohen that's purifying everybody else, he himself and whoever helps him, all of them become impure. All of them become impure, which again, doesn't make sense. If you're able to purify everybody else, it's you know obviously safe to say that you yourself are pure. You can't purify everybody else if you yourself are impure. So of course the kohen has to be pure in order to purify everybody else but at the end of his task whenever that task ends an hour later a year later a day later whatever whenever it is not a year later because no one can go that long but let's say an hour later or five hours later or, or a day later uh at the end of his task that's it he finishes job that second he becomes impure and he has to go through a whole purification uh, process now this confused even shlomo Amelech, where he says this is this is too big for me not just this mitzvah but the entire torah meaning that this mitzvah teaches us that the torah is not something that's always going to make sense to us and in fact all of the times that it does make sense to us these are not really the real reasons of why we should fulfill what the torah says and that was the problem of korach korach says that as long as something doesn't make sense to him he's not going to do it he doesn't understand why uh Akadosh Baruch Hu decided that a single string should be uh, 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 uh and therefore it's uh that's what uh um, Torah commanded but he says no but what if I have the whole thing is trelet? shouldn't that be better rationally Korach is right biblically Torah wise he's wrong halachically he's wrong so Korach didn't like that the same thing goes with people today that cannot understand free choice how can I have free choice if Hashem knows the future and you sometimes have different types of heretics that tell you yeah Hashem doesn't really know the future he knows as much as you do or they'll tell you different things that make sense to them or perhaps you'll hear people that say listen we can't prove the Torah a hundred percent but we have a uh, it's safe to say that it's certainly right meaning we're not a hundred percent sure this is not quite heresy but it's definitely stupidity spiritual stupidity so a person needs to know that even though there are certain things in the Torah that are not going to make sense to you, you should know these are not the only things that don't make sense to you because even the things that do make sense to you, they only make sense to you because Hashem allowed it to make sense to you. But that's not the real reason of why Hashem instilled those things into the world, why He commanded those things into the world. The real reason of why everything in a Torah is written the way it is, why all of the commandments in a Torah are commanded the way they are, is because it's the decree of the king. That's the reason for everything. The decree of the king. Hashem willed it, and that's how it is. And this is something that a person must uh, must accept if they want to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The second they don't accept it, they're already going on the wrong path. And unfortunately, this is one of the things that many people don't realize, don't think too much of. They simply like to accept what they like to accept and reject what they want to reject. And unfortunately, such people end up putting themselves in a very, very great jeopardy of going to gain home for a very, very long time, getting punished for a very long time. And since HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want to punish his children, what ends up happening is that Hashem tests those people in those very same things that they have doubts in order to force them to arrive at a conclusion. And of course, the right conclusion. But that doesn't necessarily always work. Because in order to arrive at the right conclusion, according to the Torah, the Gemara in Masechet Hanit says a person has to be like water. What's like water? He has to be humble like water that always goes down to the bottom, to the lowest level. 
a person has to be humble a person has to be uh, uh, uh has to acquire humility and not just talk about humility but actually acquire humility many people will say humility is very important why they themselves are the most arrogant people on planet earth so it's important for a person to know that humility is not just something that you can talk about and thereby acquire it it's something you literally have to work on in order to see things from the right perspective and of course the only true way to get to humility is through the torah itself and seeing how great the torah is and how great our god is so now the chazonish has uh, uh taught us uh over the last several weeks several strategies that we uh we are able to uh utilize in our day-to-day life of how to eliminate the bad things how to acquire the good things first and foremost to realize that there is one master bad character trait and one master good trait the master bad trait is simply giving up just i was born this way i'm gonna die this way mentality where they simply don't want to change a person that does not see the need for themselves to change and become better is certainly a person that is going to become the worst person on planet earth as they grow older as they age now they may say listen i know i need to change but simply decide to do nothing about it that's not very different that's not very different than outright claiming i'm gonna i was born this way i'm gonna die this way mentality that's the worst character trait people like this all of that terrible uh, uh all of their terrible decisions their anger their stinginess their their uh, their arrogance whatever whatever things they have all of those things stem from an arrogance that simply accept me as i am accept me as i am is a liberal mentality which is in essence telling you i have all of the worst flaws on planet earth and i don't want to change them not for you not for me not for anybody else you have to accept me as i am this is unfortunately a very common character trait it's a very common mentality that has, has become more and more popular in the world today where people simply say listen if you don't accept me as i am that means you don't love me no loving you has nothing to do with accepting you as you are accepting you as you are is the true meaning of it is meaning that i'm going to do whatever i can to help you i'm going to do everything that i can to support you so long as you are willing to help yourself so long as you love yourself the mentality of today is accept me as i am means that i'm gonna be the most run person in the world i'm gonna punch you in the face i'm gonna i'm gonna throw a, a, a dung into your food i'm gonna steal from you rob from you and, and do everything to provoke you in a negative way and you're gonna accept me as i am you're gonna love me anyway this is a terrorist mentality a spiritual terrorist a communist a socialist a psycho whatever you want to call it either way this mentality is certainly wrong but unfortunately it's become more and more common and it's actually been one of the seeds that has breeded into this homosexuality lgbt abc nonsense that they have out there i have strange desires to be like a beast i have strange desires to be like some type of uh, 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 uh animal and you should accept me as i am and in fact you should be like me also this type of mentality rabotai all stems from arrogance it comes from arrogance all of it one of my dear students recently told me that she was surprised to find out how arrogant her husband is we've been trying to help our husband for a very long time trying to get him to learn to lie, trying to get him to do what he's supposed to be doing but he simply refused he says yeah he's scared he's he's a very meek personality he's uh you know kind of one of those people that's scared of his own shadow and this and that and that's why he needs something soft maybe like a child maybe this obviously we know that's all nonsense that's just simply him you know that's his uh, the mo that's the way he portrays himself after a while you realize this guy doesn't accept anything that doesn't agree with his predisposition whatever he doesn't already uh, think if uh if it you uh, you approach him with it he doesn't agree with it he has his own way this is all arrogance how did she eventually come to terms with the fact that the root of all evil that is in her husband that's still a decent person but nonetheless has the uh, the yetzerah in him what's the root of it arrogance why when he simply refused to accept a better job than he had in the past because the new company refused to give him the title that he wanted this is obviously a deluded mentality but nonetheless it's coming from arrogance 
Many times people will will forsake a marriage, a job opportunity, uh, a certain uh, a certain uh, a certain benefit because of some superficial nonsense. How are people going to look at it? What's my business card going to say? What's the, what's the number on the house? What color is this? What color is that? All types of superficial nonsense. And it's very, very important for a person to recognize where they stand in order to know how to heal themselves. Hence the reason why the Chazoni says the worst part, the worst midad, the mother of all bad midot, is when you simply accept yourself as you are and refuse to change. On the other hand, the best character trait is the one where a person says, I'm going to do everything I possibly can, everything within my power, which changes over time to improve myself. If I see that there is something that I'm not good at, if I see that there's a weakness, if I see myself get angry quickly, if I see myself uh, having a hard time being generous, if I see myself, uh, you know, uh, bringing myself to as a uh, as a chief among others, and I uh, to think as if I'm better than others, I see different weaknesses in myself. I have to obviously catch myself and start working on those things. Now, of course, you can't work on everything overnight. Hence, the reason why part two. Of this chapter uh, uh, of this uh, section three of chapter four is the Chazuni says you have to break things up you have to break things up you have to break those character traits those negative character traits that you identified into pieces because once you've broken them up into pieces it's easier to deal with them and that's where we were last week when the uh, Chazonish brought the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot in the uh, name of uh, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai who asks his students to bring something that's going to teach a person how to live a purposeful life. Each one of the students came up with something. Rabbi Eliezer said, a good eye, having a good eye, not just for your own things, but for other things, being happy for other people, looking at things in a positive way, seeing things in a positive way, not necessarily being Mr. Pessimist and calling yourself Mr. Honest or Mr. Realistic. Being an honest person does not mean that you have to be a pessimistic person. It's important to see the positive in things. And of course, at the same token, not be a delusional person and only see positive when there's negativity in front of you. So it's uh, important to have a good eye. Rabbi Yoshua says, a, a good friend. You have a friend, you have somebody that, uh, that you call a friend. How do you determine who your friend is? Who is the one that's going to tell you the truth if you need to hear it? If that person is your friend, then yeah, he's really your friend. If he's going to tell you the truth, if she's going to tell you the truth about you going against the sham or you doing a good thing or you doing a bad thing, uh, she's going to tell you the truth when the time comes that she really is your friend. He really is your friend. But if, if not, then they're not really your friend. They're an acquaintance. They're just somebody that you like to have lunch with or have coffee with. They're not your friend. Typically, the friend is a person that's a study partner. It's a person that you learn with because you both are in a uh, 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 you know are on a journey to uh, for the truth but many times people have I have a lot of best friends this is my best friend that's my best friend I have 87 best friends when a person has 87 best friends or five best friends that means they have zero friends that's a reality why you meet any meet any old man and he asked that old man how many friends do you have just the nature of your question will make the old man laugh why because you said friends friends no, I don't have any friends. If you have one friend already in an old age, that means you're already a very rich man. Why? Because the reality is as you go older, you realize that many people cannot be your friend, either because they have a certain interest that's against your interest. They have a certain bias that's, uh, that's uh, it's in essence something that's unacceptable to you. Or perhaps they just simply care only about themselves. Or perhaps they don't care enough about you. Or perhaps they're not willing to invest into the relationship. Or perhaps they're one of these leeches that only wants to take. Take, take, take. That's not a friend. That's a leech. You could put them in a, uh, some type of pond or something or a lake. And uh, they, they belong there rather than being a friend. Or they're simply a person that's only there when there is something uh, good going on. But anytime there's tough times, they somehow disappear. They're somehow on business trips. They're somehow on vacation. They're never there for you when you actually need them. Or you need to ask them for everything. They simply are never really there to uh, check on you. And again, it's if you need to be checked on, that's something that you require from your friend. 
Last but not least, they wait for things to go wrong even though they see it because they don't want to offend you. They're not really an honest friend. They're simply a friend that's going to be that Monday morning quarterback that's going to tell you all the things you should have done. These are not friends. A friend is a person that's going to tell you what you're doing wrong when you're doing it. Not that the second that you're doing it and they're top, on top of you because nobody wants to hear rebuke every second. But again, they're going to be conscious of the fact that your best interest has to be in their mind. And last but not least, not necessarily uh, be the type of person that's only your friend because you have something that they want. Most people simply cannot get to that. Or they just simply do not have the ability to do it or the interest to do it or the time to do it because they have their own things or they have somebody that perhaps is a better friend than you are. So a person needs to realize that if you think you have friends, you have nothing. We'll also talk about the fact that if you think you have rabbis, usually you have nothing. You have no rabbis. You're your own rabbi. Why? Because there's no way that a person can have rabbis if, uh, unless this person is literally an extraordinary scholar that is learning from all and is able to accept all somehow in such a way that uh, they could uh, decipher who, what, when, and how on every single detail. And it's, uh, to say the least, very, very difficult, if not impossible, especially in our generation. But nonetheless, a person that is a, uh, uh, looking for a friend has to look for the right things. She's looking for a friend, she has to look for right things. If you're looking for somebody to have coffee with, you're looking for somebody to waste your life talking to, you're looking for things like that, surely there are plenty of people. There are 8 billion people in the world that you could uh, acquire yourself as a uh, pretend friend. But a real friend is someone that actually has to have, actually care about you, and you have to care about them. And that brings us to the second point. It's much easier, says Rabbeinu Yonah, 800 years ago, to be that good friend than to find that good friend. Much easier to be that good friend. You're going to have a very hard time finding that good friend, but it may not be as hard for you to be that good friend. To be that good friend means that you have to care about somebody else's interest, even if it negates yours. You see that your friend is doing something that may end up costing you some type of loss, but will generate them more profit, and it will be actually more for their interest. You would do what they're doing. If you were them, you have to give them that kind of advice for them to do what's in their interest. Many people are so uh, uh, connected to their own pockets and their own be uh, best uh, uh, interest that it's very hard for them to remove themselves from their own interest, thereby making it impossible for them to be good friends. So a person needs to try their best to be that good friend because perhaps as difficult as finding a friend is, being that good friend, they may have some more success in. So now the next thing that uh, the, the sages said, the Talmidim of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai said, is being a good neighbor. A good neighbor, again, very similar to a good friend, but in a more of a general. A good neighbor is a person that's going to uh, invite you to the shiul, is going to invite you to come pray. A good neighbor is going to be the one that's not going to look at your house with an evil eye and, uh, and uh, wish that they had what you have. Look at your grass, look at your house, Look at how many uh, uh, outlets your house has to, in order to determine how many rooms you have. Look at what car you have and whether it's new or it's old or what model it is. And if it's the supercharged or it's just the standard and if you have power windows. No, a good neighbor is a person that's simply looking for your best interest and is going to try to bring good to you. That's a good neighbor. Much, again, similar to a friend. Much easier to be the good neighbor than to find the good neighbor because most neighbors, unfortunately, are people that uh, are not interested in the best interest of their neighbor. They're interested in their own interest. So if they know that you have something, an event or something that's going to create some uh, uh, noise that they have to deal with, many times they're going to say, listen, you have to keep it down. Yeah, but you realize that this event is not just for fun i could also get business out of it or i'm wedding off my son or my daughter they don't really care why because they don't want their little three-year-old to wake up they don't want their five-year-old to uh to wake up they want you to uh cut your event in half because they don't want to be uh, uh disturbed even for half a second so of course again everybody has to consider each other consider their friends consider their uh, neighbors and uh, try not to hurt each other but when a person is too uh, particular about their own interest it is impossible for them impossible for them to ever be a good friend or a good neighbor why because they're only looking at their own good not the better good not the team and that also makes these people terrible employees 
terrible partners, terrible uh, 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 colleagues. Why? They're one team. Uh, they're one man team. They're not a team player. A team player is a person that's always looking at the better good, the greater good. A person that's an individual that's a loner is unfortunately the worst person on earth to work with when it comes to team efforts. And this is unfortunately very common, very common in the world today where you have talented people that simply are too arrogant to work with anybody else. This is a, 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 a good and bad. On one hand, if you have a unique project that you need somebody to focus on, it's good to have somebody that's a loner to work. On the other hand, if you want to build something that's going to, that's going to scale, that's going to grow, that's going to be something significant, you must use a team. Why? Because it saves you time. It's, it, it adds skills. It adds a lot of different things. And people that are not willing to work as a team are usually people that cannot last very long and they're simply there temporarily. Wherever they are, it's always temporary. They're never parked anywhere for very long. So a person needs to see themselves, look at themselves and say, do I care about the team or do I care about myself? If you care about yourself, you have to look at, wait, does the team care that I care only about myself or does the team actually think that I care about the team? Because this is one of the things that a person needs to ask themselves in order to determine how to proceed in their life, in their career, in their marriage, in their relationship in general, to see where they stand. If you know that your team, that your marriage, that your relationship of some kind doesn't really care and actually acknowledges and accepts the fact that you are a loner, that you're some wolf out there that's simply a, a kill or be killed mentality and they don't really care, by all means, or better said, uh, maybe a lion by yourself. But if you are uh, expected to be a team player, but you are uh, but you simply cannot bring yourself to do it, you simply think that everybody else is uh, mentally challenged, they cannot be on your level, or they're simply slowing you down, then you yourself are actually the weakest link. You yourself are the weakest link despite the talents. And this is why if you see, for example, in corporations or in, uh, uh, in sports, many times the people that are the most talented don't end up uh, succeeding very much because they can't work as a team. The, the best athletes out there many times, they end up getting fired because no one wants to deal with them. No one wants to deal with that individualistic mentality. People want people to be a team player. If a person doesn't want to be a team player, then unfortunately, this is a person that's bringing harm to themselves. So this is one of the things that a person needs to acknowledge to see whether they themselves are that good friend or that good neighbor. And Rabbi Shimon says... To have a purposeful life, you also have to have or develop the ability to see the consequences for your actions. This is common sense that's not so common. It's common sense to see the outcome of your actions. This is something that you have to teach your children to think. Think before you do. We all tell our kids to think before they do because they just, uh, they play the, and they decide to climb the counter, not thinking that they can fall. They decide to play with glass, not thinking that it can break. They decide to play with all types of things, not realizing that something bad can come out of it. So we all tell our kids to actually think before you do. We all educate them that way. But the only problem is we forget to educate ourselves that way. We forget ourselves to think. Why? Because we're so amped up with our own anxiety and when, with our own desire to fulfill that anxiety that we forget to think. We become like children. We don't have any patience. We want things right now. We don't want to wait. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. We want what we want when we want it. And we forget to think. And that's usually solves most problems is when you give yourself enough time to think. Many times when people ask for guidance and I give them guidance and they actually listen, they are amazed at how brilliant and how great, oh, this is amazing. And the reality is there's no brilliance. It's simply I'm giving you advice from a different perspective. You're inside the war and you want a, uh, uh, a solution right now. You have a certain desire you want to fulfill. You have a certain anxiety you want to remove. You're a certain problem that you can't see past. I'm not in that problem. I'm outside of the problem so I can see things from a clearer perspective and therefore give you advice based on that. But sometimes I need to think about it so I don't respond for a day or two days or a week or two weeks. And people say, oh, what? You don't care about my problem? Did you see my question? Or the best yet, I sent you an email and you only responded with three words. Did you read my entire email? If you don't think I read your th entire email, why did you send me the email in the first place? If you don't trust that I'm going to be honest enough to give you advice only after I looked at the entire problem 
and you think that I'm only looking at part of the problem, then why send me the email in the first place? Send it to somebody else. I don't need the extra work anyway. The problem is people want a solution the way they want it. They want something the, when they want it. And if you don't give them what they want, when they want, they simply reject what you give them and you simply wasted your time. This is the reason why Rav Tzion Abba Shaul, the Chavruta of Rav Ovadia, Allah Abba Shalom, one of the Gdolei Ador, many times people would come with questions and he would ask him, did you ask somebody else? If you ask somebody else, don't bother me with the question. If you ask somebody else, go to somebody else. And they would ask him, for the Rav, you know, why don't you want the question? He goes, why do I need the headache? Why do I need the headache to deal with this question that they have? If they want me, if I'm going to be the only one to ask the question, I'll give them an answer. But if they're going to go rabbi shopping and they're going to ask 57 different rabbis the same question, why do I need to burden myself with, with this? For what? And this is something what, what I tell people. Don't ask me a question you've asked multiple rabbis. Go to them. It's perfectly fine. You don't need to go to me if you've gone to other people. Why? It's simply a waste of time because more times than not, you're not going to listen to me anyway. Why waste my time? And that's unfortunately something people don't take into account. They're not a good friend. They're not a good neighbor. They're not a good student. They're not a good anything. They're simply selfish. So a person needs to evaluate themselves by looking at the consequences. If I ask this question, what is that going to lead to? Okay, that's going to lead to the, uh, the rabbi or the person spending time on this question. Well, they could have spent that time on something else. Uh, even if it's one second or 10 seconds or 10 years, doesn't make a difference. That time could have been spent on something else. That attention could have been spent on something else. Do I really need to get it from them or can I get it on my own or did I already have it and I'm simply not happy with it? Why do I want to ask? A person needs to look at things that way across the board. Before you go somewhere, what's going to come out of this meeting? Before you uh, meet somebody, what's the purpose of this? Before you eat something, what am I going to get out of this? Is this just to satisfy my sugar rush or it's simply because I'm hungry? What am I going to get out of everything? To see the consequences of everything and of course, see the consequences of bad things. When a person decides to do bad things, to steal, to cheat, to lie, to do all the things that are simply common sense that everybody knows, think about it before you do it. Don't be one of these people that eats the food without knowing that it doesn't have a kosher stamp and then you send me a picture of the wrapper and say rabbi it doesn't have a kosher stamp but is it okay that i ate this this is obviously a person that has perhaps maybe a few cockroaches and a mouse inside his head and not a brain why because this is a person that ate the food already now you're asking what's the point if i said no if i said yes what's the point if i said yes it's okay you appease yourself but you're gonna do it again because you're gonna feel safe that since it worked out the first time the next time you'll eat pig and say if, if it wasn't a rapper oh you listen 50 50. on the other hand if i say it's not okay nothing's gonna change anyway why because you already ate it where well, you say, oh, what do I have to do, tshuva? What do I do? The tshuva is you should never do what you just did again and learn about halachot. But unfortunately, many people don't think this way. They think, I have a desire. I need to fulfill that desire. I have an anxiety. I need to remove that anxiety. Go. And everything is this fast food mentality. Everything is like TikTok. Everything is like Twitter. Everything is immediate uh, uh, gra- gratification type of mentality. This is the type of mentality that will lead a person into a life of Gehenom. Not just Gehenom itself, that's after this life that could be eternal, but a life of Gehenom. Actually, this world in Gehenom. Why? Because they're constantly going to make the wrong decisions. They're constantly going to have to pay the consequences for those wrong decisions because they simply do not look at the consequences and they allow the anxiety or the desire to simply control their mood, to simply control their lives. Nine out of ten times, if you simply sleep on it, you'll get a solution. Nine out of ten times, if you simply wait, you'll be more clear-minded in order to make the right decision. But anytime a person wants immediate gratification, more times than not, they're assuring themselves of failure. So a person needs to have, according to Rabbi Shimon, the ability to see the consequences. Then Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah says, a good heart. A good heart, that's what we learned last week. You have to have a good heart. Surely this all requires constant repeating, which I'll tell you again in a moment why we needed to repeat all of this again. But the key is, the Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah says, you have to have a good heart. You have to have a good heart. Why? The good heart encompasses all of these things. You cannot have 
a good heart without being good at all of these other things so in essence what Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah says that's the umbrella when you have all of these things you will achieve a good heart when you aspire to have a good heart it'll give you the uh the, the boost and the uh, uh the uh, the willpower to have a good eye to be a good neighbor to be a good uh, uh, uh friend to look at the consequences because one lives off of the other up to this is what we learned about last week and now we're going to continue and the Chazuni says since the dise- diseases of the spirit of the neshama vary according to the variations of human nature the sages were provided with varying natures each sage possessing personal and unique talents and so the many therapies and ways of the various sages in accordance with the wisdom of each one of them enable every person to find treatments for his bad traits when the sages talked about the straight way that a person should choose it was not a discussion aimed at reaching a dry verdict do this but rather its intention was to diagnose the disease correctly and provide the proper remedy for it this is the starting point according to which the Chacham should lay out the Musar teachings to perfect one's morals, set a study program, arrange its chapters, and present it to the public for study and review so that they can review it constantly until they are cured. Each one of these sages found in himself the capability. He's talking about the sages that from the Mishnah, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Lazar ben Azar, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yosei, all of the sages each one of these sages found in himself the capability of helping people perfect their traits in a different way and he felt obligated to construct a system of musar teachings based on that point which was to have a guaranteed effect if not for all then to thousands of those whose disease responds to these teachings and they were to find a cure for it in these repeated teachings Hashem gave of his wisdom to those who fear him and each one takes what is allotted to him when Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai spoke to his disciples he said to them go out and find meaning go out and compose a book of character trait development up to now is Bezat Hashem what we're going to try to cover it's a lot of ground but it's a lot of interesting points Bezat Hashem will try to cover so now first and foremost the Chazunish tells us that one of the keys to the problem is not necessarily the teacher and not even necessarily the teachings but sometimes the problem the root of the problem is the student itself where he says that there are diseases spiritual diseases arrogance stinginess a uh, a person that is uh, stubborn and so on and so forth all types of spiritual diseases and they, they, these diseases that people have they vary but they vary according to the variations of human nature meaning that you can't just say that if this guy has a problem of stinginess and another guy has a problem of stinginess they both have the same problem why because just as they are their faces are different the way they treat their spiritual sickness is different as well he is stingy and he is stingy but they're not necessarily the same type of stingy he could be stingy only when it comes to buying things for himself he does not want to buy anything for himself he'll eat last week's food just to know not to buy a new sandwich but if his wife tells him listen honey I uh I need to uh get a new uh dress for the next event he gives her hey go honey five thousand dollars go have a good time for himself he's not even willing to spend five dollars to get a sandwich but if he comes to his family no problem if he comes to his house no problem comes to a lot of different things no problem that's a certain type of sickness another guy on the other hand he is very generous on himself he gets himself a nice Rolex, twenty-five thousand dollars or more. He gets himself a nice suit for two, three, four thousand dollars, custom made. He gets the guy to come to his house, 
to measure him and everything he gets himself a very fancy house all types of chandeliers and so on he is very large but somebody comes for a donation i don't have i don't have anything you know what you know what he gives him some few coins that he found in his pocket that he's not even sure it's his or somebody just put it there he has some few coins and i think there's a single in there when it comes to giving staka he's as stingy as he get it's a very very sick person or worse yet a person that's stingy with the people of his own house he buys himself all the things but his wife she is limited she gets an allowance of 50 dollars a week he could afford to give uh 50 000 a week but he gives her 50 dollars. why what do you need you have a house already you have a car you have a uh what do you have you have me you don't need anything so you get 50 dollars limit that's it a grown woman he's given 50 dollars now of course if that's all he could afford because he himself in the whole house is limited to 50 dollars no problem but the reality is when you're spending on yourself 25,000 on a watch and you have the audacity to give your wife an allowance of $50, you really should be put in spiritual jail. That's what you should be put in. You should be put in spiritual jail for such an attitude. A person that's stingy on his wife is a person that's destroying his life. And needless to say, a person like this makes a lot of different types of sins. A lot of different types of sins. So a person needs to know that this guy is stingy, that guy is stingy. But they're not the same type of stingy. And because their stinginess is different, says the Chazonish, the Chacham that deals with it has to also be different. Meaning, you can't just say, listen, he had a stingy problem and he had a stingy problem. And of course, this, this is, pertains to all problems. It could be arrogance, it could be uh, ignorance, it could be whatever it could be. All things. Two people, same problem, title of the problem, but they cannot go to the same Chacham. Why? <clears throat> because just like their spirit their spiritual sickness varies based on their own human nature the sages have to sometimes vary sometimes the same sage the same chacham can deal with all of them but sometimes you have to go to a unique point you have to go to someone unique so the sages were provided with varying natures each sage possessing personal and unique talents sometimes there's going to be a chacham that understands your spiritual sickness he says oh you're stingy with your wife i understand i understand why you're stingy with your wife it's not because you don't love your wife it's in fact because you love your wife too much he's like yeah rabbi, how'd you know rabbi i know i know i know it's not that you love her so much you're afraid to lose her too yeah rabbi she told you what well, how do you know yeah I know, I know i know it's not only that you love her so much you're afraid to lose her but you're afraid that if you give her more than fifty dollars, she's gonna run away from you. The guy starts crying. Boo! Yeah, Rabbi, you read my heart. No, no, it's your your the spiritual sickness. I've diagnosed it several other times before. You are simply stingy because of your jealousy. You're jealous because of your insecurity. You're insecure because you have no emunah in Hashem, and you have no emunah in Hashem because you yourself are not serving Him the right way. Huh? Yeah. So you see. He has the perfect diagnosis for this person as if he went inside his heart and read everything in there and he told him, hey, here you go. Here's why I got his report. On the other hand, is another guy. The other guy, he's not stingy when it comes to his wife. He's stingy when it comes to other things. He's stingy on, him, on his own. He doesn't want to buy himself a sandwich. Or he's stingy when it comes to tzedakah. Or he's stingy when it comes to helping other people. And that rabbi says, I can do nothing for him. What do you mean? But, but you helped this other guy that was uh, the, like one of the ten plagues. How could you not help? It's not that I can't help that guy. I'm not the source. I'm not the source. I'm not the vessel that can help such a person. For different reasons. Either because my expertise is simply not enough to heal his problem. I don't have the medicine for him. Or other reasons. It could be because he simply will not accept it for me. He is so arrogant that he is certain that his way is perfect. That he is being frugal, not cheap. He is rationalized as evil. And I simply can't help him. I can't help a person that can't help themselves, that doesn't want to help themselves, that doesn't think they need help. Or better yet, I'm revolted by his stinginess or his flaw whatever it is so much i just can't bring myself to help him it's like somebody telling you listen you want to work i want to work 
you want to make money i want to make money you want to make good money i want to make good money you want to make five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars a month sure how much do you make now two oh so this is more than what you're making sure okay we have a job for you okay fantastic when do i what, what do i do oh you're gonna work for the sanitation department you're gonna be the guy that all of the trucks from all over the city are gonna bring their filth that everybody has in their houses they're gonna bring it to the center you're gonna be the guy that processes the whole thing and then after you press it through the machine through the a little bit of broom a little bit of sponge a little bit of this a little bit of that you're gonna be the guy that makes sure that the room is clean at the end of the day how about that ten thousand a month listen I told you I want a job I want to make a living I didn't tell you I want to commit suicide no we didn't tell you commit suicide we just told you that's a job yeah that's a job but it's not for me it's not for me I'm disgusted by it some people are not disgusted by it how do I know there's people doing it there's people doing it there's people doing all types of things there are some people that literally they work with manure all day and they make a fortune out of it they make a fortune out of manure in fact in the Gemara it says that the uh the guy that was a uh, uh that was the uh, uh in charge of all the horses of Rabbi Akadosh Rabbi Udanasi he was a wealthy wealthy man he had hundreds of horses the guy that was in charge of all of his horses became filthy rich from what one of his payments that Rebbe would give him would be the manure of all the horses and he had so much he became filthy rich now of course you could say oh that's a dirty job Phil okay but it's a lot of money too some people are willing to do that if you're not then it's not a job for you the point being is that when you're dealing with people you have to know your own limitations as a teacher either this student is simply not going to accept you as a teacher why they don't see you as the vessel they see the truth but not with you they see you may have the truth but they don't want it from you or perhaps you simply are disgusted by him you don't want to help them you have no connection nigga say yeah but isn't the teacher supposed to do this supposed to do that yes at the end of the day they're all human at the end of the day nobody is Moshe Rabbeinu everybody understands their own limitations and it's better you know your limitations than pretend and end up destroying more than you built so a person needs to know the Chazon, says that the diseases vary just like human pe- human beings vary the sages were provided with a varying natures and each sage possesses personal and unique talents so not only does the student have to have a acknowledgement that they have a problem and there is a solution out there and they need to get the solution from that chacham but the chacham also needs to know if this student is the right fit too if this student is the right fit too I know a few very very serious Talmidei Chachamim they refuse to have students refuse refuse under all conditions to have students they'll take questions from people from time to time but they refuse for anybody to call them their students why they say they're not gonna listen to me anyway no no they listen you said do that yeah today they listen next week they're not gonna listen the second I tell them something that they're uh that, that disagrees with them they're not gonna listen why do I need that headache why do I need that agony that I told him something he didn't listen and now there's trouble because of it why do I need that for nobody's my student and many Chachamim refuse to have students refuse why I can tell you from experience it's much easier life to not have students much easier life not because you're looking for ease but because you're not looking for the agony and the pain of people simply not listening when you're trying your best to help them so a person needs to know where they stand if you are not the vessel don't push yourself if you are holding a problem you have a problem you have to literally look as hard as possible to get a solution to get a wise doctor meaning a rabbi Talmud Chacham, to help you with that problem now and so the many therapies says the Chazonish and ways of the various sages in accordance with the wisdom of each one of them enable every person to find treatments for his bad traits when the sages talked about the straight way that a person should choose it was not a discussion aimed at reaching a dry verdict do this but rather its intention was to diagnose the disease correctly and provide the proper remedy for it here we see that after we've identified the problem you've identified you've come to terms with the fact that you're not perfect 
perhaps you were born perfect but you've ruined it since then or you've realized that you haven't been perfect your whole life whatever the case may be you're not perfect and you need to work on things how do you know you're not perfect ask your spouse do they complain about you about anything if they do that means you're not perfect even if you disagree with them certainly they're right about something if your colleagues complain about something regarding to you that means you're not perfect if you yourself complain about something about yourself that means you're not perfect so once you've di- you you realize that there's a problem you find yourself a chacham that's not only willing to help you but is capable of helping you capable of helping you once you have found that person you start learning as much as you possibly can you start doing whatever you can because this chacham is able to treat your bad traits and when the sages in the mishnah said go find a straight path to uh, to choose from they were not telling you listen if you do this everything will work out after it but rather they're trying to tell you different things to look for in order to diagnose the root of the problem the root of the problem many times the root of the problem will give you a solution in itself sometimes a person say listen I can't stand this person every time I go to work they uh they they look at me funny every time I go to work they make a funny comment every time I go to work they're parked in my spot and so on and so forth so you think the root of the problem is this person the truth is it's probably not why it could be your insecurity your lack of amuna your jealousy it could be other things and most likely it is other things so the chacham is not supposed to tell you listen you know what just ignore that person it's bothering you that person bothers you why don't you get a different job oh you can't get a different job why don't you go to a different department oh there's only one department uh why don't you just ignore that person pretend like they're not there that's not fixing the problem that's like putting a band-aid on a heart attack so a person that wants to that goes to a chacham that chacham is going to tell you the root of the problem and the root of the problem is not that person that you are so riled up about what is it it's you you are the root of the problem your mentality is the root of the problem you either think that you're underappreciated because you're an arrogant person and think that the world owes you a thanks or you think that the world hates you because you're self-conscious or you simply are just you know lying to everybody pretending to be something that you're not and you're afraid that they're gonna find out and this is one of the people that calls you out all the time or a whole list of other different issues the root of the problem is you now where is the problem with all of this the problem is not with the teacher if you actually found the chacham to teach you then surely he's not the problem so how come everybody still walks around with practically uh, 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 critical or chronic spiritual illnesses one of the reasons is because people hear the medicine accept the medicine and then think the treatment is over and move on to somewhere else they move on to something else they figure oh I had an issue I was stingy I was arrogant I was this I was that I heard this lecture I heard this advice I had this meeting I listened I took it into account it helped I'm done that's the problem you have now created a new problem what's the new problem you have created a new mentality thinking that you can first and foremost fix all of your problems that easily two you have limited this chacham into a single issue meaning that you have taken whatever advice you took from that Torah teacher and applied it to your life and that's it and you ignore the rest of the issues assuming that since the other issues are not making any noise therefore you don't need to work on them and in essence took the gift that Hashem gave you and threw it in the garbage now sometimes a person says no no I took the advice but I also take other advice 
I have many teachers. I have many rabbis that I listen to. But yet, your spouse continues to complain about you. But yet, you're still unmarried because no one wants to marry you. But yet, you still can't even afford to buy yourself lunch because Hashem doesn't give you blessing with panasa. But yet, there's not a day that there's not a war in your house. But yet, you still cannot figure out what is the purpose of life, despite all of your teachers. Why? Just like a person that says they have a lot of friends, in reality, that means they have none. A person that says, I have many teachers, that means they have none. Because one of the things that the Chazonish teaches here is that that cure that you got, that Chacham that you found that possesses that cure, that's just the beginning. There's an endless amount more that you need from that source. And in fact, even the original medicine that you got is not enough in order to keep that spiritual illness at bay. And you have to keep going back. How long? Forever. This is one of the secrets of success to Hasidut. When they glue to their Rebbe, this is one of the secrets of success to real Tamidei Chachamim. As they have a rabbi that they listen to, a, they're a Talmid Muv'ak of a certain rabbi. They're a certain rabbi, that's who they go to, that's how they, who they ask. They don't look right or left. This is one of the verses of the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us. Not to look, a rabbi tells something, don't look right or left. One of, the, uh, one of the implications is that a person has to make themselves a rabbi and simply ask and do everything that that rabbi says. Why? Because there are many spiritual illnesses that you possess right now that you may not even be aware of. And unless you continue to yearn as much as you possibly can from the same exact source and continue to repeat the things you already had and needed and, 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 and helped you, as well as new stuff, at some point or another, you're going to veer the wrong way. But what about the thought process of many teachers, many different types of guidance? That's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because although those teachers may be good, they're not necessarily heretics, they may be good teachers, but they possess medicine that doesn't help you. What's the proof? Look at you. You have five teachers, but you still have no blessing. You have five teachers, you still have a horrible marriage. You have five teachers, you still don't know anything. You have five teachers, but you still have all the problems in the world. And no idea how to solve them. When you had the one teacher, you also had more focus in your life. Why? He possessed that cure. You had five teachers, you have no cures. So this, Rabotai, is one of the things that we see here from the Chazonish, that these Chachamim, they are in essence trying to help you diagnose the disease and provide a proper remedy for it. And just like there are many types of diseases based on the many types of people, there are also different types of wisdoms that the sages themselves possess. Not all sages have all wisdoms or the wisdom that you require. So a person needs to know these things in order to know where to go and what to, what to do if you have a halachic question, there is an halachic rabbi. If you have a personal issue, that may also be solved by an halachic rabbi or somebody else. But the person needs to know that whoever they go to, they have to see this as the only solution and not this is one of the possible medicines that I may take. When you go to different places, it's like going to three different pharmacies. Or you go to one pharmacy in the West that has practically every medicine under the sun. So, headaches. Okay, I'm going to take uh, Advil, Tylenol, store brand, and something I'm not really sure, but it has a uh, some symbol on it. I'm going to take this one too. I'll just take all four pills and pray to Hashem it all works out. Pray to Hashem you don't die. That's what you should pray to Hashem. Because the reality is you take everything just to see everything works out. Everyone normal realizes that's dangerous. Same concept and even more so when a person learns from everybody. That's not the way to do it. Now you're going to say, wait a minute. But didn't David the Melech say, Mikol Melamdai Skalti? Yes, David the Melech says, I learned from all of my students. I learned everywhere I can. There is learning and then there's learning. Meaning, 
there are different things that you can learn from there's an article there's a shiur there's a uh, whatever it is there's all types of things you can learn from but there is a source a source that you in essence get everything from all of your spiritual nourishment is supposed to come from that main source everything else is extra whenever there is a uh, uh you know extra time if that extra time exists unfortunately today with the growth of the internet the torah world also grew and what ends up happening is that many people for whatever reason or another don't feel that it's enough to get their spiritual nourishment from a single teacher they feel like they need to listen to three or four or five or six or seven different rabbis and i've been young and i've been old and i've never seen a single person achieve the status of a Talmud Chacham having five different rabbis it simply does not exist you listen to three four five different rabbis every single week you simply know nothing nothing not only do you not know what you think you know but you don't know anything why because each rabbi has a different way a different uh, 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 conclusion a different thought process and in essence a different cure that may or may not jive with your neshama if it jives with your neshama then certainly that's something you should get everything you possibly can go to his books from 500 years ago go to every one of the sources that he mentions go to every shiur literally invest every little bit of yourself into that source but if you watch a shiur and nothing changes for you it's interesting it's mentally stimulating but it's not going to cause you to do anything in your life guess what that means that even if that teacher is a good teacher that helps many many other people he's not your source and he never will be and all you're doing is wasting your time that's all you're doing and unfortunately Rabotai, many times I hear people say yeah no listen I have a serious schedule I listen to this and I read this and I do this and I said wait how do you do all this and you still don't know anything how how do you do all of this and you still don't know anything this is the this is one of the reasons this is one of the reasons where a person has many different choices but in reality that subconsciously puts themselves in a situation where they're saying listen I have this shiur and in this shiur he talked about the parasha and he said don't be a liar don't be a heretic don't be this yeah but let me see what rabbi x also says and he listens to rabbi x and rabbi x talks about something completely different different completely different idea in the parasha what does that do that rabbi now takes away what he was supposed to learn what he was supposed to learn now is his mind is on rabbi x's idea why because rabbi x's idea is more appealing it requires nothing it requires him to do nothing he likes doing nothing she loves doing nothing she listens to 10 20 30 different rabbis and guess what the combination of all of them requires her to do nothing because the second one of those 20 has the audacity to tell to put a kisui rosh the second one of those rabbis has the audacity to tell her to be mothers what does she do click i'm going to a different rabbi i don't like when the rabbi talks uh tough I, I like him when he's nicer he talks about amuna he talks about shlombait he talks about cooking he talks about kosher he talks about the subjects that i like today he's uh maybe he's in a bad mood i'm gonna go to rabbi b i'm gonna go to rabbi c i'm gonna go to rabbi e and what ends up happening 20 years she's listened to shure torah nothing changes why she doesn't have a rabbi she doesn't have a source they're all good but she's not good he's not good and there lie thereby the outcome is rotten rotten this is also the same thing where sometimes i've seen this with my own eyes honestly if i didn't see this with my own eyes i wouldn't know how to explain this to you i had a guy who called himself as, as my talmid for a while Baruch Hashem, he doesn't call himself my talmid anymore thank god thank god Baruch Hashem, a million times maybe i should say tailing 100 just to say thank you hashem for not allowing such a thing to, to, to call himself anything connected to what i do this guy literally every other day he would ask me what give me more titles of books i want to buy books he would literally buy every book under the sun every book under the sun he would tell me listen i finished this book this book. i'm like wow this guy's a genius how do you finish all these books one book one book another book another book another book and it was all you know musar books and amuna books and all types of books and this guy was like literally eating the books amazing but yet nothing changed he was still a thief he was still a liar still rotten and how do i know i experienced it from this person everything stayed rotten why 
He was looking, delving into things superficially. Yeah, he read the words, but applied zero. Why? Because always another book. This rabbi said, don't be a liar with business. Okay, so I'm not, okay, fine. Let me see what this other rabbi says. Oh, this guy said, don't be a liar when marriage. So maybe marriage is more important. All right, I guess since I'm not married, I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, but what about the long, don't lying in business? No, listen, if don't lying in business was so important, this rabbi would also mention it. Since he didn't mention it, then it's probably not that important. This rabbi is probably stringent. Maybe somebody took advantage of him, and that's why he uh, said don't be a liar in business. And they start putting all types of foreign thoughts into the mouths of the Chachamim. Why? The delving into and everywhere and accepting nothing. Accepting nothing. This is unfortunately a very, very common problem today because... Torah has become so accessible that literally with the press of a button, you could go to Bezot Hashem application, press play, end up in Gan Eden, or you could press play at some other website and go to Gain On. Why? They give you a choice of a thousand different rabbis with a thousand different Ashkafot. Some of them are heretics, some of them are actually Christians, and some of them, only a Kadosh Baruch who knows what they are. And some are good. And since you like to delve around like you buy different vegetables every week, you do di- different salads every week, different rabbis every week. And what ends up happening? The cure exists, but you refuse it. You reject it. Why? Hashem sent you the cure. He said, maybe there's something easier. Maybe there's something sweeter. Maybe there's something that uh, I don't even have to take. Maybe there's a cure out there that I don't even have to take it. I don't have to do anything about it. Maybe that's the cure. Doing nothing. And thereby lies the failure that a person brings on themselves. Continues the Chazonish. Continues the Chazonish and says, this is the starting point according to which the Chacham should lay out a Musar teachings to perfect one's morals, set a study program, arrange its chapters and present it to the public for study and review so that they can review it constantly until they are cured. Here is the whole point of what I've been saying, saying it ahead of when I read it, where if a person has found some chacham that they are reading his book or watching his shurim or attending them or whatever it is, and they attended and they got the siyat dishmaya that that chacham addressed their issue, whatever issue they had. It helped them, it applied to them, and they utilized it and it worked. That person should literally sell their house if they have to, just to get more from that source. Why? That's the cure for every spiritual ailment that they have. But if they go to a shoe and all they hear about is the business success of this guy and his uh, side companies, and all they hear about is how he likes to go on vacations, and all they hear about is how you should be nice to people because one time he was nice to somebody and that somebody ended up being a good customer or something like that. But in reality, they're not really helping their issues. All they need to do is run out and never return. Why? They don't have the cure anyway. Maybe next time, if they don't have the cure, they don't have the cure. Even if they have a cure for somebody else, doesn't mean they have a cure for you. Because the one that has the cure for you, you need to do whatever you can to adopt their study plan, their study program, the one that they've arranged, the one that they're presenting to the public, study it, review it, constantly, until you're cured. Of what? Of everything. Everything. Every single ailment that you have. Everything. You may say, wait, but maybe he's good at teaching halacha, but he's not good at teaching Musar. You may be right. Those are two completely different uh, subjects, perhaps. Usually, it's not common for one to be good with one and not necessarily good at the other, but some people just specialize in one thing. I personally don't necessarily teach Allah on a regular basis. I teach here and there during the Shurim, but I expect people to read Allahic books in order to learn most of what they need to learn because it's so easy to learn Allah. That, that pertains to your day-to-day life. And if somebody has a question, of course, we can answer it. But the point being is, is that the shurim themselves, the lectures themselves, are for the general public, regardless of where they stand, whether they are new students, old students, uh, Bale Tshuva, converts, Frum from birth, Hasidish, Avrechim, rabbis, it doesn't make a difference. It's Musar, it applies to everybody. 
This is why Baruch Hashem, we had the Siyat Nishmai to have all types of students from all over the world at all different levels. People that are searching the truth, Baruch Hashem, are glued to the screen when they watch the Shulim. But unfortunately, one of the difficult parts that you have to see is that people fall off at some point. They go, they learn, they get the chizuk, they start transforming their lives, and then somehow they disappear one day. As if they're like air. As if they were never there. It was like a ghost on the internet. They just disappear. And I'm not just talking about their donations disappear, or their likes on Facebook and and YouTube disappear. They literally disappear. There's no more messages, there's no more acknowledgement, there's no more responses, nothing. Sometimes it comes from shame that they haven't been around. Sometimes it comes because they're busy. But sometimes it's because they found something more appealing. And typically, the more appealing is destroying them. The more appealing is typically something that is giving them the comfort that whatever they're doing is enough. Yeah, but when they first started with you, They knew right away they weren't doing enough. And then they changed. Yes. But then after doing more and more and more and more, and the Torah obligating them to do more and more, they fell for the trap of the Satan, who came to them and said, listen, there's another guy. There's another woman, Rabbanit, another rabbi. Really, really nice. Very popular. Wrote 17 books. Must be good. Try it out. And they do. And guess what? They enjoy it. Not only is the speaker compelling, not only is the speaker smart, mentally stimulating, good stories, but the best part is, compels them to do nothing. Obligates them to do nothing. Why? The goal of every lecture is to remind them to love themselves as they are and do nothing about it. Simply love yourself trust yourself and don't push yourself too far you may destroy yourself in the process and guess what they do destroy themselves by running away from a cure that grows with time into neutrality and eventually destruction and when that teacher comes back into the picture somehow and says hey how are you how's everything i haven't heard from you in six months Oh no, everything is uh, everything is good, everything is good. And they say, you know what? Since I saw this teacher or somebody recommended, let me press play again. I used to like this guy. And they press play, and all of a sudden, ah, oh, they can't deal with it. Why? He reminds them that they're still arrogant. He reminds them that they're still stingy. He reminds them that they've become less modest than they were six months ago. He reminds them that in reality, this new teacher or teachers have actually been slowly but surely destroying them and their spirituality. And they're not ready to change like they were when they first started on the road five years ago. So what do they do? I'm going back to my regular teacher. He's he's more up to date. He's more up to date. He, He makes me feel good. Makes me feel good about being a sinner. And that's why Rabotai Karim, the Chazuni says, that a person needs to find this study program, study it, review it constantly until your problems are cured. Until your problems are cured. If it cured that original issue, it can cure all of the issues. The second you start delving into other things, you are simply taking things that are at best neutral, at worst poison. Each one of these sages, says the Chazonish, found in himself the capability of helping people perfect their traits in a different way. And he felt obligated to construct a system of Musar teachings based on that point, which was to have a guaranteed effect, if not for all, then to many thousands of those whose disease responds to these teachings. And they were to find a cure for it, for these teachings. Hashem gave of his wisdom to those who fear him, and each one takes what is allotted to him. When Rabbi, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai spoke to his disciples, he said to them, go out and find, meaning go out and compose a book of character trait development. See so here, 
the Chazonish is in essence telling us if you search enough in the world of Torah, certainly you will find many Chachamim. Some of them put themselves out there like the Talmidim of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai as teachers, not just as students, but they want to teach people. They feel an obligation to teach people. Says the Gemara in Masechet Avodah Zarah, a person that learns Torah without an intention of teaching anybody other than themselves is like a person that does not have a God. Why? Because in order, when you learn Torah, you in essence get closer to Hashem. The more you get, the closer you get to Hashem, the more you want to emulate Hashem. One of the main things to emulate about Hashem is that He always gives. If a person learns, 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 and gets all the gifts from Hashem and doesn't want to give and share that with others, that's like a person that doesn't have a God. So surely all Chachamim teach somebody. They teach their kids, they teach their, their spouse, they teach a, few, a group of people, but there are some out there that teach the public, they teach everybody. Either way, if you go out into the Torah world, you're going to find some Chachamim, you're going to find some people that are wise. Just because they're wise and just because they possess the cure, it doesn't mean that the cure is for you. If you have found someone that's not only a Chacham, that's honest, that's not only a Chacham that's honest, but also has the cure, and not only Chacham that's honest that has the cure, but the cure is for you, you literally have to do everything you possibly can to glue yourself through that as much as you possibly can and literally run away from everything else that distracts your attention. Why? Because everything else may be good, just not for you. We're not talking about the heretics and the liars anymore and, and all the people that are changing the Torah. That we've already done. We've covered it time and time again. We're talking about, assume that there are, let's say, a hundred really good teachers out there. A thousand, a million, whatever it is. Just because they're all good and all honest and all wise and all great doesn't mean that they're for you. You may have a foot problem and thereby going to a heart doctor is not going to solve it. Why? He's an expert, but in hearts, not in feet. You show him your foot, he's going to show, he's going to tell you, put your shoes on and get out of my office. Like, nothing, has nothing to do with what I do. So, even though there is going to be many wise people, doesn't mean they're all going to be a right fit for you. So a person needs to know that there are going to be, there are going to be wise people out there, and a person has to make themselves a not only a rabbi, but literally a, a source for all of their spiritual nourishment in order to actually fix themselves. Because when they try to delve into multiple types of wisdoms, they end up with nothing in the end. You know, it's like saying either be a master of all trades, uh, a master of a, of a trade, um, I'm sorry, be a, uh, uh, um, a master of none. When you know a lot of different things, you end up being a master of none. There's an expression, I'm, I'm forgetting, it escapes me. Baruch Hashem, I don't forget, uh, I forget Torah, but not this. Uh, that I won't forget Torah and I forget this. But uh, the point is, is that a person sometimes will, uh, uh, will sometimes delve into a lot of different things and end up acquiring nothing in the end. Nothing. And this is why the Hasidim have succeeded, the Talmud Chachamim have succeeded because they glue to a central source. Now, of course, when you get yourself into a uh, situation like that and you tell some people that do not respect Talmud Chachamim, do not respect rabbis, do not respect anybody that's not themselves or anyone that's alive, and you'll tell them, listen, this is my teacher, this is my rabbi, and they're going to tell you, listen, your rabbi may be good, but I have a different rabbi. Why don't you listen to this guy? Why don't you read this book? If you tell them no, because you're okay with what you have, they take offense to it. Why? Your rabbi knows everything. There are, there are other people that know no stuff. He's not the only one. Now, if you argue with them, you're simply wasting your time. Why? If they think that you can just recommend any rabbi to anyone, that means that they themselves are spiritually sick and do not have anyone to cure them because they don't accept anyone that has a cure. They think you could just recommend good speeches, good stories, whenever, however, and create that as the source of information for you 
for this period of six months, a different source of information for you for the next six months, and the next six months another one, and they think that it's okay that you have all of these teachers. And unfortunately, what ends up happening with people like this is they never really truly acquire knowledge. They never acquire knowledge. Now, there was a um, a uh, Chacham that uh, was very, very successful and but very, very humble that the Rav Vadya mentions in his Anaf Etz Avot. In his uh, Mishnah number 16, Perik Aleph, that talks about Aselech HaRav. says yourself, make yourself a rabbi in order to eliminate the doubts. To show us to what extent, to what extent a person sticks to the truth. And also to what extent that Chacham can save a person when they allow that Chacham to do so. So there was a true story about a Daniel Yaffe, who was a uh, Chacham, was a uh, very successful, very uh, generous, and also knew a lot of Torah. And, uh, but more than Torah, his generosity paved him a, uh, paved him a uh, road to admire. Now this Daniel Yaffe, he uh, lived about uh, 250 years ago, 260 years ago. And uh, he made a fortune in banking. And then after banking, he uh, made a, a lot of money in other businesses. But he wasn't always rich. When he was a young boy, he uh, was learning in a cheder. And then uh, he was learning with another guy named uh, David Warshiner. Now David Warshiner learned Torah with him and Cheder and everything, but he didn't have the same success in business after uh, the Torah world, after Yeshiva. And uh, the two obviously went in different ways. Many, many years, decades passed. And David Warshiner was still a pauper, didn't have much money. One day, David wanted to marry off his, uh, his daughter. And uh, his neighbor, who admired David and his son, being a Talmud Chacham, said to him, listen, I uh, want uh, my son to marry your daughter. But the only thing is, we need, uh, you know, we need your daughter. I want my son to continue uh, learning. And uh, your daughter definitely is a tzaddikah. So, but I want, your, uh, I want my son to continue learning. So I need you to come up with some money. So I'm only willing to allow my son to marry your daughter if uh, your uh, if you come up with ten thousand dollars for them to start off their life now david said listen as much as i would love my daughter to marry your uh, righteous son that's a talmid chacham and surely can be something great one day i don't have access to that kind of money this is more money than i have this is more money than uh, not only for her there's more money than i have as a house i don't have any kind of money so his neighbor says, yeah, listen, you told me one time that you used to be in a cheder learning Torah when you were a kid with uh, Daniel Yaffe. You know, he's become very, very successful. Why don't you go to him and ask him for uh, to help you? Surely an old friend can help you. David said, you know what? Why not? I'll go if he's so successful and we know each other. Surely he gives taka. Why not help an old friend? Why not help my daughter get married? Sure. He found out where he is and he uh, went to go visit him. Now, 40 years have passed. So when he first saw him, you know, Daniel Yaffe didn't recognize who he is. So he was planning, oh, here's a few dollars. He goes, you don't recognize who I am? He says, no. He says, you remember? And he mentioned something that they learned together 40 years ago. Goes, Oh, David, my dear friend. Oh, it's been so long. And the hugs and the kisses. And how are you? How are you? How are you? How's everything? And they start talking. And he's like, yeah, listen, I uh, wanted to tell you. I uh, wanted to see. Maybe you could help me. And uh, I'm trying to marry off my daughter. And, uh, you know, she's a really good girl. She's, uh, she found a nice chatan, Talmit Chacham. And, uh, you know, listen. 
a, uh, I didn't have the same fortune as you. The best fortune that I have is that, remember that time when I had that pocket knife? And, uh, you know, you, uh, you like my pocket knife? And I told you, listen, you know, I'm willing to give it to you, but what do you want to pay for it? And you said, listen, how about this? You give me that pocket knife, and I'll give you every penny that I have after I have $10,000. Everything I'll give you. That's the most I ever had. And I gave you that pocket knife. Now, Daniel Yaffe didn't just think that his friend David was mentioning that story. He thought that he actually means that he has to deliver on that promise. Immediately, Daniel Yaffe got sick. He didn't feel good. He started sweating profusely. His friend David says, you okay? Because, yes, yes, but why don't we uh, get together later today, perhaps come back at 4 o'clock so I can rest a little bit. So sure, no problem. They part ways, and Daniel Yaffe runs to his house, goes to his wife and says, my dear wife, I'm sorry to tell you, but we are completely broke. She says, okay, my dear husband, I still love you, still accept it, still live with you, but can you tell me why? He tells her, listen, my old friend, David, just reminded me of a promise that I made. I made a promise 40 years ago that I wanted this knife that he had. And I told him that I'm willing to pay him every penny that I have after I acquire $10,000. And now he's come to collect it. So I have to give him all of our money. Because I took the knife. His wife was a very wise woman. She says, listen, perhaps you do. But I don't think you do. Because when you made that promise, you didn't have as much money as you have right now. And you didn't even know if you're ever going to have $10,000 at all. And more so, you could have paid him earlier. Meaning that as soon as you got 10, 11,000, you could have given them the 1,000. So we need to go to our Rav. And he says, to her, sure, yeah, of course, we have to go to the rabbi. And they are both ready to accept the dean from their rabbi that's going to tell them what he has to do. Meaning he is already ready to part with all of his wealth the wife is ready to part with all of their wealth. We're talking about millions here. We're not talking about he has 20,000. They go to one of the great sages of the time, Rav Tzvi Hirsch. And Rav Tzvi Hirsch knows a student and says, yes, what's the problem? And he tells him, he says, my dear student, you have a good heart, but you don't owe him anything. According to Deen Torah, you don't owe him anything. And he gives him all of the Allahic reasons of why he doesn't owe him anything. You didn't, when you made the promise, it wasn't under these types of conditions. When this, different details we'll go over, perhaps another time we go into the dissect this story. And he says to them, don't be distraught. This is a classic case of a person who attempts to transfer the ownership of something that he doesn't that doesn't exist where at the time that you owned the knife that you took the knife you had no money at all and therefore the transaction that you made by taking the knife for a potential possession that you don't own at all was not really a transaction halakhically that's binding and therefore your your friend david was uh, uh you know was aware of this and he only gave you the knife because he wanted to make you feel good not because he actually expected you to deliver on your promise but he knew that you're not going to take it for nothing so to make you feel good he said yes to your offer you're a good friend so logically you don't owe him anything so after he explains this to him Daniel Yaffe accepts the Dean and he comes back to his friend they meet at four o'clock at four o'clock he opens a suitcase takes out a hundred thousand dollars he says here his friend david shocked says whoa 
No, it's, it's, it's too much. I, I don't need all this much. I just, I just need 10,000 for my daughter. This is way too much. David Yaffe is confused. He goes, what do you mean it's too much? You came and told me that I owe you everything beyond 10,000. This 100,000 is not all I have. I have much more than that. I'm just giving you 100,000. Because according to Allah, I don't have to give you everything. But I want to give you something. David says to him, no i didn't mean that i actually am entitled to all your money i was just telling you a story like you know like reminiscing of the past that the best thing i ever had was you know the knife that i gave you that i was able to do a mitzvah to make you feel good i didn't i didn't actually expect you to deliver on the promise i just wanted to make you feel good but you didn't want to accept the knife because uh you wanted to give me something but you didn't have anything so i said "Ah, i had this possession one time this knife that was worth a lot to me. Why? Because it was worth, I was able to make my dear friend feel good. That's it. I didn't mean you actually have to give me all this money. So no, no, just give me 10,000. He goes, no, no, no. I'm giving you 100,000. I'm giving you 100,000 because now I want to help you. Take 10,000, give it to your daughter. Take 50,000, start a business. And the rest, put for retirement. And that's what he did. When he went home, he didn't go home the same way that he came there. He came, he went there with like a honorable person with a carriage and so on. But here we see Rabotai, the story by Rabu Vadya and his Anaf Etz Avot, extraordinary sefil, true story of how a person was willing to literally go to the end based on their rabbi's decision. Now, surely only a fool thinks that this is the only time that daniel yaffe encountered his rabbi only this one time surely there were many other times that he learned from this rabbi and he asked him questions and he did whatever the rabbi said but the point is that if you ask your average person today who's your rabbi usually they'll tell you two or three names if you look at a shiduch resume of the average person Usually there's two, three, four, sometimes even five or six different rabbis. If you ask a person, do you watch Shura Torah? Who do you watch? Usually they'll mention three, four, five, six, seven, ten different names. If you ask a person, are you happy with your Torah, with the way your life is going? Nine out of ten times, they'll be too embarrassed to tell you the truth. Because although the rabbis they have may be very good it's not possible for all of them to have that cure it's not possible for them to accept the cure from all 10 of them even if they had it because when there are so many choices people end up choosing nothing so you see when a person delves into it and delves into it our holy torah they'll find that the most successful people were the ones that stuck to a source they saw good from. Another story that Rav Ephraim mentions in his sefer, in the uh, most recent sefer that he published, Asicha Shvuit, in Parashat Lech Lecha, story about Rabbi uh, Levi Yitzchak Berdichov, the great Hasid, the great Tzaddik, the great uh defender of israel this tzaddik helped endless amount of people and the amount of stories that are told about him have literally filled the pages of countless books one of these stories is uh the story that rabbi Ephraim brings in a sefil page 37 in uh, parashat lech lecha where there was a famous person by the name of rabbi Aishel. Who was a student of Rabbi Levi Tzachak Miberdichov, and Rabbi Aisha was extraordinarily wealthy. He was good in business, he was honest, and he was very generous. And one day, he comes to Rabbi Levi Tzachak Miberdichov and he says, "Rabbi, tell me what you need, and I'll write you. I'll give you the money right now." And he has a big smile on his face. And the rabbi says to him, what, what is this for? Why? He says, Rabbi, I just made a fortune in a business deal. I'm very happy, not just from the fortune, but also it's good timing 
because I'm marrying off my daughter. So double, uh, double blessing, I'm marrying off my daughter, plus I made a lot of money. Rabbi, I need to do something good. Please give me something that I can give it to. Rabbi Levit Simon Belichov says to him, take a certain amount of money, as much as you want, and give it for this specific cause to help Am Yisrael. He gives the money, no questions asked. Both part their ways. The uh, Rabbi Aishel goes back to his business and starts setting up all the things that are needed for the wedding. Of course, a rich man has to have a rich wedding for his daughter. It has to, you're not just uh, uh, rich for no reason. This is actually one of the things that uh, Rabbi Udana C writes in the Gemara, uh, brings in the Gemara that a person that's rich needs to look rich. You can't look like you're a bum if you're a rich person. It's a, uh, Hashem decide that you're going to be rich. You have to show yourself as you're rich because people need to know who to go to when they need staka. Sometimes there are people that hide their wealth, like some of these Hollywood stars that look like they're homeless, even though they have a hundred million dollars in a bank. This is not the way of Torah. Way of Torah is people need to know that you're rich so they can go to somebody that can help them. You were, Hashem gave you wealth. That's a responsibility. So Rabbi Aisha helped many, many people. And surely the time came to prepare for this wedding and they bought all types of new jewelry and all types of dresses and all types of things but as you would have it he gets robbed they leave the house one day they come back and the house is robbed all of the things they have prepared the special dresses and the special jewelry and all of the special possessions they have for this wedding everything was robbed Rabbi Aisha comes to his rabbi Rabbi Levi Tzakim Berdichov and he says for the rab I don't know what to do they robbed us. The wedding is in uh, the next couple of weeks. What do I do? Rabbi Levit Zagreb says to him, go to the Bedin and tell them you've been robbed and to pass Kinadin on it. Rabbi Aisha doesn't know what the rabbi means, but the rabbi says he does. He goes to the Bedin, makes an appointment, sees the Bedin. Everybody knows Rabbi Aisha, the wealthy Gvir that helps everybody. But they have no idea what he's talking about. He said, you sure that Rabbi Levi Tzangin Berdichov sent you here? He said, yeah, of course. And he told you to come here to get a Din Torah? Yes. For what? The thief that stole from me. Okay, where's the thief? He goes, I don't know where the thief is. So what Din Torah do you want us to do? If you brought the thief here and you can prove he's the thief, then there's something, but just you? What Din Torah do you want us to do? He said, I don't know. I'm not the rabbi. Said, We're sorry. We can't help you. Rabbi Aisha is confused. He goes back to Rabbi Levi Tzachim Berdichov. He says, Kvod Rav. They don't know what to do. Rabbi Levi Tzachim Berdichov says, Okay, you have a uh, scroll. You have some, some type of, uh, something to write on. A parchment. Sure. In those days, they used to carry things, carry parchment like people carry notepads. And he gave him a piece. Rabbi Levi Tzchak writes, Lo Tignov, don't steal on one corner. Then again, don't steal on the other corner. Then again, don't steal on the other corner, and then don't steal on four corners. He says, okay, here, he gives him the piece of paper, the parchment with don't steal on it. Lo Tignov, he goes, okay, don't worry. Your uh, money will come back to you. Now Rabbi Aisha is even more confused than he was from the beginning. First the rabbi told him, go to the Bedin. Then the Bedin told him, we have no idea what you're talking about. Then he comes back to the rabbi and the rabbi writes, don't steal on, on, on the four different corners of the paper. And he tells him everything's going to come back. No clue. Did he doubt the rabbi? No, he just knows I'm not having an idea what's going on. If the rabbi said, the rabbi said, okay, he has no, fine. He said everything's going to come back. Okay, everything's going to come back. We're only a few days away from the wedding. The rabbi said, the rabbi said, I don't understand. That doesn't mean anything that I don't understand. He goes home and he decides to go take a walk in his forest. He has a far, huge house, forest, big area over there. He starts walking over there. And all of a sudden, he sees some people, some commotion, gets closer. They see him. They all run away. He immediately goes to where they were and he sees all of his stuff 
the dresses, the jewelry, the, the everything that they stole from him, all is over there, inside his own forest. Quickly, he gets people to collect all the stuff and gets back. And, of course, he's as happy as can possibly be, but he has to go see his rabbi, ask him, Rabbi, how did you know? What is this? What did you do? He goes to Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, he says, Kfod Rav, how did you do it? He said, I didn't do anything. He goes, no, no. The, the, everything was in my uh, in my field. They brought, oh, that. Oh, no, nothing. I didn't do anything. But how did it happen? He said, listen. When you told me that these bandits, these thieves, stole from you, automatically I knew that they're going to try to hide it. Because everybody knows who you are. You're a big veal. You help a lot of people. So surely everyone is waiting to see if these losers are going to try to sell your stuff to them and immediately get them arrested so these thieves they're probably not stupid so they're not going to try to sell everything right away they're going to try to hide it and where are they going to try to hide it they try to hide it under the ground so i sent you to the bedin so the bedin can pass in that they are thieves they stole it and write on a on a piece of paper once the Bedin writes on a piece of paper, then in Shemaim, they also know these people are thieves. They stole Rabbi Aisel's stuff. Don't accept it. The ground doesn't accept it. No one is allowed to accept it. But since the Bedin didn't know what I'm talking about, I was forced to do it myself. That's why I wrote on a parchment. I wrote, don't steal four corners of the world. You are now aware that they stole whatever merchandise they have they stole from rabbi Aishin. you're not allowed to accept this because if you accept it you're partners to the crime and what happened is every time they tried to hide this stuff the ground would spit it up and what ended up happening when you saw them i saw in Ruch HaKodesh, i saw when you came over there Immediately they saw you, they ran away. Why? Because the ground just spit up all the stuff they dug out. So that's it. Here you have it. I didn't do anything. He says, Rabbi, that's amazing. Rabbi Levit, Sagan Velvichov says to him, What's amazing? The ground is also not allowed to steal. When a person appreciates their source of holiness, of Torah, of teachings, they'll be amazed. And how much they benefit from it in ways that they couldn't even imagine. Our Chachamim have been with us from the time that Akadosh Baruch Hu created this world. But of course, Abutai, there's always going to be the people that are going to detract us from the source. One of the greatest sages that we've had in the last 150 years was the Talmud of the Rabbi Israel Misalant. And his Talmud was the Saba Minavarduk, the author of Navarduk, Rabbi Yosef Yoizil. Now the Saba Minavarduk, although he wanted to be uh, focused on fixing himself and perfecting himself, and he was an extraordinary Talmud Chacham, eventually when he realized that being uh, alone and recluse is not for that generation anymore and it's time to help Amisal do tshuva. He used all of the gifts that Hashem gave him to open 70 yeshivot and create a, literally a extraordinary world full of Torah. Now, this Saba Minavardok or Alta Minavardok didn't do it quietly and everybody accepting it quietly in fact in a bio that was published recently it says that in the year 1896 1897 the popularity of the altar of Navadok grew tremendously and so did the dissension increase in the yeshiva world when it came when it became known that the altars kolalim and yeshivot were including Musar teachings as an integral part of their daily schedule. A number of Rabbanim published letters against him, saying, should Musar, based on the teachings of Rabbi Yisraeli Salant, be taught as part of a parcel of yeshiva studies? Did a student who spend all day studying Torah need to spend time perfecting his midot? 
And some of those who objected the Musar studies requested that the residents of Novaldok withdraw their support of his yeshiva. Meaning not only were they not approving of his teachings, but even more so, they wanted to hurt him by encouraging the people that support him, that they may or may not know, encouraging them to stop supporting him, stop donating to him. Why? He is mistreating our uh, people. How? He's teaching a Musa as if our uh, Gemara and our uh, Mishnah and our Chumash is not enough. He's teaching a Musa as if they're not already uh, doing enough. And they literally went right for the pocket. I've seen this with my own eyes with different Reshaim that try to discourage people from donating to our organization. Why? Because we teach Musa and they think that uh, Musa is not for this generation. This is not a new thing. One of the fathers of the, uh, of, of the uh, yeshivot of the world today got the same exact letters. Of course, he had supporters and the, uh, the residents of Novaldok published a public letter on Thursday, the 3rd of Sivan, June 3rd, 1897, saying, this is not a cult. The students are Torah scholars who study Shas, meaning the Talmud and Alacha diligently, we're not wantonly spending our money to support them. Their way of study is approved by great Torah scholars, straight and pure people. They, are, they have no ulterior motives. All they do is for the sake of heaven. We know this clearly. We feel the need to announce this publicly in the name of truth. And the son of Minavaldok also had the Rav of Navaldok, the head Rav, which was a Aruch uh, Shuchan, one of the Gdole Ado, the Baal Aruch Shuchan. Don't mistake it with Shuchan Aruch, that's, 500, that's 400 years before it. Aruch Shuchan, also a very sa- fa- famous sefer. Rav Yechiel Michel. And uh, the, Ra- the Rav of Navardok was also backing the Sabami Navardok. But needless to say, many, many people went against Rabbi Israel Misalant and his student, uh, the Sabami Navardok, and didn't just go against saying this is not good don't use this but they wanted to bankrupt them why because truth and falsehood cannot coexist in peace so sometimes that truth and falsehood will be very apparent very obvious a person can see one person is telling the truth another one is lying one teacher is teaching the truth Another one is creating a new truth out of his own philosophical mindset. That should be easy for us to decipher. The more difficult part to decipher is when you have multiple teachers of truth. You have 10, 20, 50, 100 teachers of truth. They all have their own style. They all have their own wisdoms. They all have their own gifts. And it's important for a person to know that although they're all truthful teachers, you cannot dip into all of their wisdoms and make all of them your rabbi because when you make all of them your rabbi all of them become simply ineffective when it comes to you because once you have a certain spiritual sickness not all medicine will work for you not all of them will possess that medicine and a person needs to be honest with themselves to know which one is and which one isn't if they're truly aspiring to get a cure the only thing that will stop a person from acquiring that medicine is not shortage in the torah not shortage in torah teachers but rather shortage in them being honest with themselves to explain this i'll Tell you a story and we'll finish it off from there and you'll understand perhaps Bezal Hashem. Rav Ephraim says in his Sicha Shvuit Sefer that in the time of Noah there was a very unusual thing that happened. Noah is in a Teva and Noah is feeding each one of the animals. 
Each day, Noach does it on his own. Each animal, whether it's the crocodile, or it's the lion, or it's the zebra, or the giraffe, or whatever it is. One day, the lion gets really upset with Noach because Noach was late with his food and he hurts Noach badly. And Noach suffers, the Midrash says, agonizing pain throughout the majority of that year that he's inside that Teva. From that one time that the lion hurt him. Now, of course, you could say, you know, that lion is really ungrateful. How could he hurt the hand that feeds him? Okay, he's an animal. And you're right, he's an animal. But Rav Kalmanovich put it differently. Rav Kalmanovich says that you see, that lion. He's not just any lion. Why is not any lion? After the Holocaust caused the destruction that it did, and the Nazis went everywhere, Alev Kamenovich, by pure miracle, escaped Europe and went to China, to Shanghai. Over there, he tried rebuilding. But the few Jews that were there were not really supportive. So he asked the people a question. He says, what's so different about this lion that hurt Noah? You can say he's ungrateful, but he's an animal. He has an excuse for being ungrateful. I'm saying there's something different about this. What's so different? The people were confused. What's so different about this lion? Rav Kalmanovich says, he says, this lion, he knows he's the last lion. There's no other lion. There's no other lion in the world. He is the only lion left. And because he's the only lion left, a lot is on the line, Noah. You can't just skip my meal. Because if I die, there's no more lions. Rav Kalmanovich says to the people there, you see all of the destruction that the Nazis have caused and how many millions of our brothers and sisters they've murdered. These few Bachurim that I have with me learning Torah, these are the last of the lions. There's no more lions. We have to feed them. We have to make sure that they stay alive so the Torah stays alive, so Judaism stays alive. We take that teachings and we apply it to ourselves. You see, Rabotai, we know that there are extraordinary teachers out there. We know that there's extraordinary emet. The Chazonish tells us that yes, although there is great emet out there, that doesn't mean that you just delve everywhere whenever. You have to be specific to your spiritual illness. And the only thing that will stop you is if you delude yourself to thinking that you are the lion and there's nobody else like you anymore. In reality, a person that has arrogance and refuses to accept the cure for that arrogance will only allow themselves to continue with that mindset if they delude themselves to thinking they are the lion, they are the special one, they deserve special treatment, they can handle multiple teachers, they don't need to change, they are perfectly fine, and Hashem Yirachem on those victims that that false lion surrounds himself with. It's important for us to know where we stand. When we know where we stand, a Kadosh Baruch cure is readily available to us. If we don't know where we stand, and we think that our rabbis and Talmidei Chachamim are on the same levels as us, instead of learning with them, we'll offer them something to learn. 
instead of asking them we'll give them advice instead of yearning more teachings from them we'll simply run away from them the second they teach something that applies to us it's important for us to be realistic when it comes to the torah and to view it as the only cure to our spiritual ailment and the chachamim that hashem sends us pick the doctor that affects you the most that has the pure cure for you and say that's the doctor hashem sent me i'm not going anywhere medicine to no end once a person looks at things that way then perhaps they'll see the benefits and the blessings that the torah is able to give them and they'll see themselves flourish in torah in mitzvot in good midot in maasim tovim in everything that hashem wants to give that person if only we'd stop pretending to be the lion and realize we need the lion amen amen Hi everybody, very happy to announce a major event coming up in Eretz Yisrael. This event is going to be unlike any other we've done as an organization. Last year we had a group of uh, young guys that completed the entire Shas, Bavli, and the Mishnayot in a single year. This year we're going to have the entire foundation of the Oral Torah completed in a single night. Uh, our own dear uh, Ephraim and other Talmudim of the organization. In a single night we'll have the completion of the Shas Bavli. Shas Mishnayot, the Zohar Kadosh, Zohar Chadash, Tikkunah Zohar, and the Shulchan Aruch. Years and years of toil, lots of effort, is coming to fruition, and uh, in a single night, all of it will be completed to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. This is going to be a night where many Rabbanim, many Tzadikim will be joining us at this event. There'll be hundreds and hundreds of people at the event in Eretz Yisrael, uh, including the Rishon Etzion, Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, of course, our own very dear Rabbi Fahim Kachlon. I myself will also be joining coming to Eretz Yisrael for the first time in many years to join this monumental event, this monumental Kiddush Hashem in order to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name to show him how much we love his Torah, how dedicated we are to his Torah and to be able to Be'ezrat Hashem, give Chizuk to Am Yisrael in another way. Be'ezrat Hashem, Yirgun, Be'ezrat Hashem, Mit'ated, La'asot, Kenes Gadol, Shama Yeh Siyum, Al Ikarei HaTorah Shebe'al Peh, Shese Siyum Kol HaTalmud Bavli, Siyum Kol HaShisha Sidra Mishnah, Siyum Kol HaZohar HaKad, הקדוש ותיקוני הזוהר וסיום כל השולחן ערוך. בדרך כלל לוקח זמן כדי לסיים את כל הספרים הללו, 30 שנה, 40 שנה, ובסייעתא דשמיא הארגון בעזרת השם עושה את הכנס לכל כלל ישראל. כולם מוזמנים. We're looking forward for uh, this event. We're also looking forward to seeing some of you that are going to be joining us. There are going to be some sponsorship opportunities for anyone that wants to uh, be able to be a part of it. Uh, and of course, there'll be an uh, opportunity for any of you that want to join us, uh, one way or the other. Uh, last but not least, there will also be a raffle that we'll be uh, announcing very soon for anyone that wants to uh, join the raffle and also be able to do Kiruv at the same time. The winner of the raffle will win a uh, flight ticket to Eretz Yisrael uh, and be able to join us at the event. So uh, please look out for more news. Looking forward to seeing you at this event. And Bezad Hashem, Naseh, Venetsliach.